So I want to direct you to Mark chapter 13 as we continue our study in this uh, wonderful gospel account. Mark chapter 13, and I want to read verses 24 to 27. Specifically today, we will look at verses 26 and 27. The title of the message is The Second Coming, and this would be part two of what we began last Sunday. The Word of God reads, beginning in verse 24, And in those days, after that tribulation, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will be falling from heaven, and the powers that are in the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. And then he will send forth his angels and will gather together his elect from the four winds, from the farthest ends, from the farthest end of the earth to the farthest end of heaven. Very clearly in these verses, the Bible teaches that this age will be brought to cataclysmic conclusion with the second coming of Jesus Christ. How different it will be when Jesus comes again. When Jesus came the first time, there was no room for him in the end. But when he comes again, he will inherit the earth for his kingdom. When he came the first time, he rode into Jerusalem on a lowly donkey. But when he comes again, he will descend out of heaven on a white steed at full gallop and will come back to this earth as a conquering general. When he came the first time, he wore a crown of thorns. But when he comes again, he will have many diadems upon his head in a show of strength and sovereignty. When he came the first time, he came as a lowly bondservant. But when he comes again, he will be a bold sovereign. He came the first time to redeem. When he comes again, he will reign. He came the first time to a cross. When He comes again, He will come to a coronation and to a crown. At His first coming, He was executed. At His second coming, He will be exalted as King of kings and Lord of lords. At His first coming, He stood before Pilate. At His second coming, Pilate will stand before Him. What a difference it will be at the second coming of Jesus Christ. Everything will be reversed from the time of his first appearing. Satan will be thrown into hell. Sin will be punished. Christ will be enthroned. Wrong will be dethroned. Right will be rewarded. All of this dramatic change will be ushered in at the time of the second coming. And how we should long for this day to come to planet earth. In these verses, which I just read, Jesus himself describes his own second coming. Uh, This is not merely the prophets or the apostles describing what will it be at the end. And when the prophets and, and, and apostles speak, they speak with absolute inspiration and infallibility. But there is something special about our Lord describing His own second coming. How personal are these words to Christ? And how personal they should be to us. In verses 5 through 23, which we have spent some time uh, working our way through it, we have seen the description of the tribulation of the last days that will precede the coming of Christ. And by any reading of these words at face value, it is easy to understand why this is an unprecedented time in the history of the world. There is no epoch, there is no era that even begins to compare to what will take place immediately before the second coming of Christ. No wonder this is called the Great Tribulation. And so as we look at these verses last time together, we looked at verses 24 and 25, and we called that the cosmic disturbance. Because immediately preceding the second coming itself, and at the end of the tribulation, 
there will be unprecedented, extraordinary cosmic signs in the skies above that will announce the coming of Jesus Christ to the earth. In verse 24, just for a moment to review what we said, we read, but in those days, after that tribulation, stop right there, there will be a specified season that we believe to be seven years, a certain number of days. Jesus says in those days, it will be a time of tribulation and even great tribulation. He has said so earlier in verse 19 when he spoke of those days, there will be a time of tribulation. And so in this time, we read in verse 24 that the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will be falling from heaven. The entire universe will be in a state of convulsions as if all created matter are ready to explode into upheaval at this time of the climax of the Great Tribulation, as if the entire universe is about to split in half, as if all of the planets themselves are ready to break in two, as human history is disintegrating and coming to an end. In fact, Jesus said that if God did not shorten these days, even the elect themselves would not escape it. That in the skies above, there will be these extraordinary cosmic disturbances in the great day of God's wrath. Revelation 6 identifies this tribulation as the great day of God's wrath. The prophets spoke of this coming day, just to give you two cross-references. In the book of Isaiah, Isaiah 13 and verse 9, we read, Behold, the day of the Lord is coming. And this is a catchphrase. This is a signature phrase, the day of the Lord, that is used by the prophets to speak of that time in the future when the Lord will dramatically intervene into the affairs of human history. And it become His day. There is a sense in which this day is Satan's day. He is the God of this age. He is the prince of this world. And under the purview of the sovereignty of God, he is allowed to have great sway. Look around. Read the paper. Look at television. It is as clear as a bell. This is the day of the reign of sin. This is the day of the reign of Satan. There is no other interpretation. But in the day of the Lord, God Himself in His Son will return to this earth and it will be a dramatic takeover of the planet. And when Christ returns, He will come back in judgment and in power. And it will be accompanied by signs in the skies. Isaiah 13, verse 9. Let me read verses 9 through 11. Behold, the day of the Lord is coming, cruel, with fury and burning anger, to make the land a desolation. And He will exterminate its sinners from it. Now listen to verse 10. For the stars of heaven and their constellations will not flash forth their light. The sun will be dark when it rises, and the moon will not shed its light. That's exactly what Jesus is saying in Mark 13, 24 and 25 that we have been looking at. The prophet Isaiah says exactly the same thing. Then verse 11. Thus I will punish the world for its evil, and the wicked for their iniquity. I will also put an end to the arrogance of the proud, and abase the haughtiness of the ruthless." Close quote. 
the time of Christ's return, it is known as the day of the Lord. And it will be accompanied by extraordinary signs in the skies as Christ comes to take over planet Earth. Joel chapter 2 also says the very same. And earlier in Joel chapter 2, he says that the future day of the Lord will be associated with cosmic disturbances in the skies above. Listen to verse 2. A day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness. Verse 30. I will display wonders in the sky and on the earth, blood, fire, and columns of smoke. The sun will be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. So when this day of the Lord comes, it will be accompanied by these extraordinary signs in the skies as the sun will not shine and the moon will not give forth its light and the stars will fall from the sky above and it will signal that there will be out of heaven descending through these very skies the return of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. It is as if these cosmic signs and disturbances are preparing a highway in the atmosphere above for the return of the Lord Jesus Christ as he comes back to inaugurate his day upon the earth. This leads now to verse 26. If you come back to verse or Acts, uh, Mark chapter 13 and we come to verse 26. I want you to see, second, not only the cosmic disturbances, but I want you to see, second, the coming Savior. Verse 26 is such a precious verse. For all who love the Lord, it speaks of the time and the event of the actual second coming of Jesus Christ. And so we read in verse 26, then they will see, stop right there, immediately after these cosmic disturbances with the sun and the moon and the stars, then signifying in sequential order right after that, they, referring to all the inhabitants of the earth, the elect among the remnant of God's people, uh, the false Christ and false prophets and those who are following after the false prophets in their in their pagan religion, and the Antichrist himself, the whole world will see with their own eyes. They will visually see this extraordinary sight of the second coming of Jesus Christ. And notice how Jesus himself portrays his own second coming. The Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. If your eye could ever behold any sight that is recorded in Scripture, I cannot think of a more dramatic and a more uh, visually stimulating sight than to be able to see this second coming of Christ. Several things I want to point out to you about this. First, how Christ identifies himself the Son of Man. I would remind you that this is his favorite self-expression. More than any other title, he identified himself as the, sec- as the Son of Man. And that was to identify with those who live here upon the earth. He came the first time as the lowly Son of Man who came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Mark 10, 45. When he comes again, he will come in power and in glory as the Son of Man in exaltation. Now, notice he is coming in clouds. Do you see that? Now, this cloud, I believe, is either, well, obviously, it's either physical clouds or some sort of supernatural clouds. And if it is supernatural clouds, it would be the Shekinah glory of God. 
of that glory cloud that led Israel in the wilderness. That glory cloud that filled the tabernacle in the wilderness. That glory cloud that filled the temple in Jerusalem. I believe is most probably this same glory cloud that will accompany the return of Christ. And what a sight this will be. He will come back, as it were, riding the same Shekinah glory cloud back to the earth. And this Shekinah glory cloud is brighter than 10,000 suns. And I would remind you in the previous verse that the sun will be darkened and the light will no longer, the moon will no longer give its light. The universe will be as pitch black dark as the universe could possibly be. And it will be at that moment that a door will be opened in heaven and the light of the throne room of God and the light of the glory of God and the light of this Shekinah glory cloud will light up the universe and it will draw the focus of every person living upon the earth as it will be the only light that will be that will be descending down from heaven. It will be an extraordinary sight that is perfectly fitting this occasion. As Christ comes back, he will not come as a lowly babe in a manger in Bethlehem, but he will come back in this stunning display of pomp and splendor sovereignty. Now, you will note in this verse, in Mark 13, verse 26, that in the middle of the verse, it's in all capital letters, the Son of Man coming in clouds. That is to signify to us it is drawn from the Old Testament. And I want you to turn back with me to this Old Testament text. It is in Daniel 7, verses 13 and 14. Our Lord is quoting Scripture here from the prophet Daniel, as Daniel looked ahead to the time of his coming. This text is the most frequently quoted verse from the book of Daniel in the New Testament. This text stands out of the book of Daniel as really the Mount Everest. And in Daniel chapter 7, we read beginning in in verse 13, Daniel is the recorder, and Daniel writes, I kept looking in the night visions. And in these visions, a vision differed from a dream. In a dream, the man who was seeing divine revelation was asleep. But with a vision, the one who is receiving this revelation is awake. And Daniel is awake. And his senses have never been more alert. And God is causing the future to be made visible before his eyes. And God is causing the future to pass before the eyes of Daniel. To allow him to see the prophetic future. And what Daniel now sees is the most extraordinary sight. He sees a coronation. So he writes, And behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man was coming. Uh, these clouds, I believe, are the Shekinah glory cloud, shining in bright splendor. And the Son of Man is the Messiah. This is a messianic title. The one who is coming in power and glory. The one who is coming from God who will usher in the kingdom of God upon the earth. And what has preceded are the four great earthly kingdoms represented as beasts and part of a statue. And they represent the, the Medo-Persian and the Roman and the Grecian and the Babylonian empires. But there is a final world kingdom and a world ruler over this world kingdom that is being played out before the eyes of Daniel. Daniel is now allowed to see beyond the king and the kingdoms of, of Babylon and the Medes and the Persians 
and the, the Greeks and the, the Romans. He is, a now, he is allowed now to look to the coming of the Messiah, the Son of Man, who will come back and inherit the earth and who will rule with world dominance, where even the previous earthly kings have failed to establish complete control. And so he saw one like a son of man was coming. And he came up to the ancient of days. This coming is not the second coming. This coming is his approach to God the Father after his first coming. Upon his return back to heaven, after his death, burial, resurrection, and ascension, as he re-enters the throne room of heaven, to the astonishment of the angels, Jesus Christ returns back to the throne of God, and he approaches the Father, who is represented here as the Ancient of Days, capital A, capital D, as the eternal God who was and who is and who shall be forever, from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. Psalm 90, verse 2. And so he came up to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him in this official ceremony that is a coronation. Verse 14. And to him, referring to the Son of Man, was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom. The dominion here speaks of absolute sovereignty. It speaks of supreme authority. It is the fulfillment of Matthew 28, verse 18. All authority in heaven and earth have been given unto me. And Christ, by his obedience to the Father and his sacrifice at the cross, is now qualified to be enthroned at the right hand of God the Father and to be the one who will rule over all of the affairs of providence. And this began 2,000 years ago at the time of Christ's ascension back to heaven. And to him was given dominion. And with this dominion comes glory, which is the praise and the worship that is rightfully due the one who has bestowed dominion by the Ancient of Days, and a kingdom. There is given to him the right and authority to rule over the kingdoms of this world. And this kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. Now note in verse 14, that all the peoples, nations, and men of every language might serve him. Previous in the book of Daniel, this is what Nebuchadnezzar was after. This is what Belshazzar was after. This is what all of the great kings of the earth have so sought, to be the object of praise and to be the one to be served by all the tribes of the earth. But they have never been able to corner the market. They have never been able to assert themselves. But Christ is now given this dominion and glory and kingdom over the entire created order of planet Earth. Verse 14 continues. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which will not pass away. Meaning, unlike Nebuchadnezzar and Belshazzar and Alexander the Great, and the Caesars of Rome, they all had their puny little hour of human history. They had their moment to reign over a temporal kingdom that was passing away. But when the Son of Man is installed in His kingdom, and there is the inauguration of His reign, He will never be removed from the seat of power And he will reign forever and ever and ever. My friend, that day has already come. 
that day has come at the time of the ascension into heaven of Christ and the enthronement of the Lord Jesus Christ. And right now he's got the whole world in his hands. Now, at this present moment, he continues to let the world order go in a way in which Satan is the God of this age and the ruler of this world. And Christ has not yet fully exercised all of the throne rights in establishing his kingdom on this earth. The fulfillment of that awaits the second coming of Christ. He has already been enthroned. He is already reigning. There are no maverick molecules, as R.C. Sproul says, but there awaits in the future a time of more direct and immediate exercise of his sovereignty to be brought to bear upon the affairs of this world. And that will come to pass at the time of the second coming of Christ. And that is why Jesus quotes this verse from Daniel 7, verse 13 and 14, to tell his disciples and to tell us that the future second coming will be the time when he will establish his kingdom and rule and reign directly and immediately here upon this earth. And so when Christ returns, let me give you now some words that will describe the actual second coming of Christ. As Christ will appear, he will appear, number one, personally. Matthew 16, verse 27, for the Son of Man is going to come in the glory of his Father with his angels. Christ himself in an in a human body, in a glorified body, will return to planet Earth just as he came the first time and just as he ascended back to heaven, so he will return at the end of the age. It will not be merely the Spirit of Christ. It will not be merely the angels. But it will be Christ himself, personally, bodily, in glorified form which leads second to not only personally, but bodily. Acts 1, verse 17, the angel said at the time of the ascension of Christ, this Jesus will come in just the same way. Those are the key words. Just the same way as you have watched him go into heaven. Well, how did Jesus go into heaven? He was standing on the Mount of Olives in Acts chapter 1. And in verses 9 through 11, he simply levitated, if you will, and ascended upwards into a cloud where there were two angels who gathered him and escorted him back up to heaven from whence he had come. And the disciples were standing and watching the bodily uh, ascent of Christ back into heaven so the second coming will be exactly like that. Jesus will come back in flesh and blood, in his resurrected body, in his glorified state. Third, he will return visibly. What is so unique to this is that every eye will see him. Uh, that is what it says in verse 26 then they will see the Son of Man coming. In Revelation 1, verse 7, we read that, Behold, He is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see Him. Fourth, He will come dramatically. Verse 26 says He will come with great power and glory. Matthew 16, verse 27, the Son of Man is going to come in the glory of his Father with the angels. This will be the greatest show of strength in the history of mankind. This will be the greatest display of glory, sheer glory, 
that this world has ever beheld. This will be the most dramatic entrance of any individual onto the stage of world history. Fifth, he will come wrathfully. As Jesus comes back, he will come to wage war with his enemies. Isaiah 66 in verse 15. For behold, the Lord will come in fire and his chariots like the whirlwind to render his anger with fury and his rebuke with flames of fire. Understand this. When Jesus came the first time, he came not to judge, but to save. When he comes the second time, he comes not to save, but to judge. Second Thessalonians 1, verse 7. The Lord Jesus will be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire. And I think the idea here is that the, the glory surrounding the Lord Jesus Christ at his return will be so bright, it will appear as if he is on fire. That he is coming back in flaming fire, so consuming and so visibly awe-striking will be this sight. The Lord Jesus will be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, dealing out retribution to those who do not know God and to those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. These will pay the penalty of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. So Jesus will come back personally, bodily, visibly, dramatically, wrathfully, and number six, triumphantly. And I ask you to turn with me to Revelation chapter 19. Revelation chapter 19, as John has recorded for us, for our benefit, the actual second coming of Jesus Christ. And he will come back so triumphantly. It will be the full exercise of all of the sovereignty that has been invested in him. And so in Revelation 19 and verse 11, we read. Let's take just a moment to look at these verses. And I saw heaven opened. And the idea here is the veil pulled back, or as it were, a door opened in heaven, which normally is allow us as the reader to peer into heaven to see what is inside of heaven, but in this instance, it is to allow the one who is in heaven to emerge and to come forth for us to see. And I saw heaven open. To this point, heaven has been closed. And no one has been allowed to peer into the unknown world of heaven above. But I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse... And he who sat on it is called faithful and true. Now stop right here. The first century reader was very familiar with this imagery. In the Roman triumphant procession, whenever a Roman general went off to a foreign land and won decisive victory and conquered a certain number of people and captured a certain number of lands and annexed certain numbers of peoples into the Roman Empire, when he returned back to Rome, he was qualified to exercise what was called a Roman triumphant procession that led through the streets of Rome to one of the seven hills and on top of the hill, there Caesar would await him. And when the general would come back, he would have the spoils of victory behind him. And he would have his conquered foes being drugged by their chariots. And the conquering general would be out front. And he would be prancing 
on a white steed, on a white horse, and it stood out visibly as you are the returning, conquering general, returning now with all of the spoils of victory. That is the imagery that the first century reader would have understood as John paints this picture that Christ is the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the Caesar of Caesars, the dictator of dictators. He is the general of generals. He is the greatest of all of the leaders of men in any military enterprise. And so I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on it is called Faithful and True. Faithful and true, representing that he is returning, being faithful and true to the promises recorded in Scripture and by his own lips, that there will be this day when the Son of Man will come back in clouds with great power and glory. Faithful to his word, true to his promises, this one now emerges from heaven. At the end of verse 11, he tells us why he is bursting onto the scene. In righteousness, he judges and wages war. He has come back to unleash his holy wrath against sinners who have long despised the gospel and who have rejected the words of the Father it is now a day of gloom and darkness, a day of judgment for those on the earth. Verse 11, his eyes are a flame of fire. Nothing escapes his all-penetrating gaze. He sizes up human history and all of the nations and all of the world leaders for exactly what it is. Nothing has been pulled over his eyes. Nothing has missed his rightful interpretation of world events. Now, what follows in verse 12 is absolutely shocking. And on his head are many diadems. Unlike the crowns that are placed upon the heads of men, a Stephanos, this is a diadem which is only on the head of God. But it is not a single diadem. It is many diadems, which is to communicate infinite sovereignty. And he has a name written on him which no one knows except himself. The meaning of this is... His sovereignty is incomprehensible. It is unfathomable. The supreme authority that belongs to the Lord Jesus Christ as diadems are stacked up upon diadems upon his head. However sovereign you and I think God is and Christ is at this very moment, we have never even begun to scratch the surface of the full measure of the absolute sovereignty of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is beyond our calculation how totally dominant and in control He is over every facet of human history and over every molecule in the universe. Verse 13, he, he is clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and this blood is not the blood of his first coming, his own blood. This blood is the blood of his enemies. And it is so certain and so sure that they will be destroyed, and their carnage is spoken of at the end of this chapter, as all the birds of the sky will come and devour them after Christ carries out the infliction of his judgment upon the time of his return, that the blood is already on his own robe. We read at the end of verse 13, and his name is called the Word of God. That title signifies that Jesus is the visible expression of the invisible God. 
just as a word communicates what you cannot see inside my head and inside my heart, just as a word becomes the vocal expression of what is unseen or unheard to you, so for Christ to be the Word of God, He becomes the perfect and full radiance of the glory of God to man. When He comes back, He will not be clothed in the form of a bondservant. He will not be veiled in His humility. He will come back as the Word of God, the full blazing manifestation and demonstration and revelation of the essence, the being, and the perfections of Almighty God. Verse 14, And the angels which are in the armies which are in heaven, clothed in white linen, white and clean, were following Him on white horses. I would take this to be the saints of all the ages, who are dressed in the perfect righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ, who have already been presented faultless before the throne of God. And they are dressed in white linen, which is also their, their good works, which have followed them to heaven, and they have been rewarded for these good works. They are now dressed, we are now dressed in white linen, and we are surrounding the Lord Jesus Christ in a dramatic display of solidarity and strength with Christ. In most armies, the soldiers go first, and the general comes in behind. But in this return of Christ, He leads the way. And we are coming back as the armies of heaven. And it gives the the appearance of clouds that are rolling in the skies. Verse 15, from His mouth comes a sharp sword, so that with it He might strike down the nations. And He will rule them with a rod of iron. And he treads the, the winepress of the fierce wrath of God, the Almighty. It will be a day of vengeance. It will be a day of fury. It will be a day of inflicting judgment. It is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Verse 16, and on his robe and on his thigh, the idea here is is that there is a banner that is stretched across his robe that extends all the way down to his thigh. And on this banner, he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Literally, kinging over the kings of the earth and lording over the lords of the earth, judging over the judge, judges of the earth, princing over the princes of the earth, as he possesses and exercises unlimited, unrestricted, unhindered sovereignty over all the tribes of the earth and over all their rulers. What an extraordinary sight this is. And as we live on this side of the second coming, and as we go through difficulty all around us, and as we see this world and this earth growing further and further away from the Lord, we must remember that this day is fixed on God's calendar. This day is coming. There is a day in which Christ will return to this earth and He will make right every wrong. He will avenge the blood of all of the martyrs and He will take the devil and consign him to hell and all of those who are unbelievers shall be lowered down into the abyss below and He will establish His kingdom and His reign here upon the earth as the great King of heaven and earth. That day is coming. And what encouragement it should give to us as we find ourselves in darker and darker days, knowing that this Christ is coming back and He will make every matter right. Now, I want you to note finally in verse 27, the celestial attendants. 
We've seen the coming Savior and the cosmic disturbances. I want you to note in verse 27 of Mark 13, the final verse that we will consider this morning, the celestial attendance. Because when Christ returns, He will be surrounded by many attendants. And He will be accompanied by not only the redeemed of all of the ages, but He will be accompanied by the angels themselves. Now, we are not told how many angels will come back with Him, but we know from our study of Scripture that there are myriads of myriads, which means ten thousands in the plural, times ten thousands in the plural. And when you do the math on this, there are multiplied billions upon billions of angelic beings. As you lay all the zeros out, and we are not told how many angels will be returning with the Lord Jesus Christ, but surely it will be a display of extraordinary strength and sovereignty as He will be attended by the angelic hosts in a display of supremacy over the entire created order. Notice, He will send forth the angels. God the Father and God the Son will commission these angels to attend the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, the angels were here at His birth. The angels announced His birth to Mary and to Joseph. The angels announced His birth to the shepherds who were in the field. It was the angels who were with Him during the 40 days and 40 nights of fasting in the wilderness. It were the angels who attended Him to His needs in the Garden of Gethsemane. It was the angels who stood at beckoning call, ready to descend from heaven as Christ hung upon the cross. It was the angels who came for Him at the time of His ascension and escorted Him back to the throne of God. It is the angels who have been around Him for the last 2,000 years in His very presence, declaring, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. I am sure that Christ takes but one step from the throne to mount this steed, and all of the angels of heaven are at His beckoning call. They are desirous of returning with Him. They want to always be at His side and to serve all of His needs and they are ready to step forward in any day of battle and to serve His cause and do whatever they can to extend His kingdom. Yes, these angels are descending with Him at His return. And as they come back, we read that they will gather together His elect. Please note, they're not coming back for religious people. They're not coming back for those who simply profess to know Christ. Uh, they're not coming back for those who have uh, the name of Christ, but not the possession of Christ in their heart. They are coming to the, for those who are truly saved and will gather them together. And those are identified by the tap root of sovereign election. Those whom the Father has chosen by Himself and for Himself before time began are the ones that the angels will gather up and gather to the Lord Jesus Christ. And I believe that in this very difficult time of human history, there will be extraordinary strength that will be drawn by God's people from the truth of the sovereignty of God over their own salvation. As the whole world is in the, is in the course of exploding and the skies are literally descending and disintegrating above, they will draw greatest strength for their soul in this doctrine that they are the elect of God. They have been chosen by God and nothing can ever separate them from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. The more difficult the hour, that any believer goes through, the more precious is the doctrine of election. And it is when the church is in a time of prosperity, when the church has become flabby and soft, when the church has lost her vision of Christ, when the church has become like the world, that is when the church rises up and hates the doctrine of election. 
because she feels as if her style is being cramped by the sovereignty of God above. But when the church sails the good ship of grace through the storms of life, when the church finds herself in the darkest hours of human history, when the church finds herself being persecuted and being martyred, as she will be in this last hour of the tribulation, she will cling to the truth that though she is rejected by the world, she has been chosen by God from before the world began. Let us glory in this truth. Let us revel in this truth. Let us be humble in this truth. But we shall sing forever and ever before the throne the song of the elect of God, that we have been chosen by Him for reasons known only to Himself, and that we are eternally secure in this God, though all hell break out upon the earth. No matter how great the tribulation, nothing will ever cancel our election and predestination with God the Father. Now, notice at the end of verse 27, these angels will gather all of the elect from the four winds. That is a metaphorical way of saying from all points of the compass or from all the points of the earth, north, south, east, west, from every little village and town, from every continent and tribe, from every language group and race of people, they will gather together all of the elect in that last day. And then he adds, from the farthest end of the earth to the farthest end of heaven, which again is a very colloquial expression that means from everywhere from every remote town and city, from every faraway village and camp, from every densely populated city and backwoods intersection, from the hot deserts to the frigid ice caps, from steamy jungles to cold terrain. All of the elect will be found by the angels and will be brought together with Christ. And we will stand together with Christ and all of the elect of heaven will be returning with Christ at His second coming. And Christ will establish His kingdom here upon the earth, and He will usher in a new day. And in that moment, all of the elect of God in heaven and on earth, all of the elect from the Old Testament and the New Testament, all of the elect from the beginning of time to the end, will stand together as one people and look upon our Savior. And He will begin to reign for a thousand years here upon the earth. The curse will be removed from the earth. The wolf will dwell with the lamb. The lion will lay down next to the young goat. The cow and the bear will graze together. The lion will eat straw with the ox. The child will play with the viper, and the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the earth. And paradise lost will become paradise regained. And what the world once was before sin entered and God put the curse upon the earth, the earth will become the glory of God again. And where the first Adam failed and the curse entered the earth, the second Adam has triumphed at the cross and the second Adam will return at the second coming and will establish this world for a thousand years as the beauty that God originally intended it to be. And after the first thousand-year reign of Christ, there will be ushered in the new heaven and the new earth, and the eternal state where we will live with God forever and ever. And we are the bride of Christ, and we will be the second Eve to the second Adam who has triumphed in obedience. So let us long for the second coming of Christ. See every trial in light of this coming day. 
Make every decision in light of this coming day. Live every day in light of this coming day, for Christ is soon to burst upon the scene and to usher in his kingdom here upon the earth. The story is told of a farmer who was laying in bed with his wife one night, and the grandfather clock went off in the living room, 10 o'clock. Twelve o'clock, one o'clock, or thirteen o'clock, fourteen o'clock. The wife woke up and said, what time is it? The husband said, I don't know, but it's later than it's ever been before. What time is it on God's prophetic calendar? I don't know, but it is certainly later than than it has ever been before. May we be dressed in readiness. May we be a bride adorned for her husband on that day. May we be found faithful when Christ returns to planet Earth. Let us pray. Father in heaven, let us draw strength from these words recorded by Mark, the very words of the Lord Jesus Christ. I pray that we may draw great strength for our Christian lives as we see that a coming day is on the horizon, the time of the return of Jesus Christ. Father, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.